Okay. We are in the business of shrinking JavaScript for CS1. Your presenters here are Boyd Anderson and myself, Martin Hens, and this is joint work with Lokok Lim and Daryl Tan. We are from the National University of Singapore. A quick overview after the motivation, I'm going to present four shrunken JavaScript dialects. Uh, Boyd will then talk about the implementation and the outcome. As a background, uh, NUS started using the SICP textbook in 1997 in a CS1 course. SICP is the Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs, a classic computer science textbook written by Hal Abelson and Jerry Sussman. Uh, and since 2018, this course is compulsory for all uh, computer science first year students at NUS. Uh, and that meant that we had to scale the course from originally uh, 48 in 2012, uh, when we started to use JavaScript, to uh, 670 this year. Why are we still using SICP for CS1? Well, the, uh, every department uh, has their own reasons. Uh, uh, we think that students benefit from SICP's emphasis on abstraction as well as on the mental models for computation rather than uh, uh, particular problem solving techniques. Programming as communicating computational processes rather than uh, getting programs to run to solve problems on the computer. And finally, uh, we have heard already earlier today the uh, rise of functional programming uh, in uh, today's world of uh, uh, software. Um, uh, of course, SICP was way ahead of its time, and uh, we increasingly in the School of Computing uh, um, uh, appreciate a functional programming first approach. Why do we want to use a modern language such as JavaScript or, or Python rather than the original language in which SICP was written, Scheme? Well, we think that the, the transfer of knowledge is easier uh, when the uh, language is similar in syntax to the language that students will use in their later courses. And syntax matters. Uh, I think personally that Python and JavaScript programs are more readable than programs written in Scheme by and large. And if you don't agree with me down there, there is an, uh, an email address to vent off your, um, your rage. Um, Students' motivation increases when the language is obviously useful to them. We had earlier, we heard earlier today that students are looking for internships, you're looking for, for their first job and want to uh, have something that makes sense uh, to the employers uh, on their CV. Uh, what do we mean by shrinking a language? We force students to use our sub-languages. And that means, Language features outside the sub-languages are simply not available. In our IDE, in our program environment, they just cannot do what, uh, they cannot use those features. And why do we shrink a mainstream language for CS1? Um, well, um, we think that uh, for freshmen who are new to computing, uh, the barrier of entry is lower when you start with a very small language, a minimalist language, uh, rather than a full industry strength language that has, uh, in the case of JavaScript, um, you know, 800 pages of, of specification uh, with, with tons of uh, features and uh, every year with features that uh, be, features being added. Uh, for us instructors, we can focus on the learning outcomes and we're not distracted by uh, constructs that are not uh, conducive to the particular uh, topic at hand. And finally, uh, it is easier to, to implement tools for programming if the language is small enough. And in fact, all the tools that you have seen earlier today uh, in the robotics and you will see are implemented by students in term projects. As an example, what we mean by shrinking the language. Here you see uh, what, what um, uh, Eli called an anti-pattern. 
um, you see an, uh, an uh, equality test uh, performed on a Boolean value. That is, that is clearly uh, overly verbose. We don't want the students to write these programs. And we, we, what we do is we simply restrict the triple equal operator to operate only to, to not operate on Boolean values. That can be done when you uh, have the power to shrink the language. A more extreme example is that object-oriented programming is not introduced in, uh, in our uh, CS1 course or in SICP, and therefore our JavaScript sub-languages do not include objects. Here's the language progression in our CS1 course. The language that we start with is called source chapter one. So chapter one is a tiny JavaScript sub-language, uh, just expressive enough to cover the first chapter of SICP JS, which is our JavaScript adaptation of SICP. It is the Lambda calculus uh, plus uh, uh, statement-oriented syntax, plus some primitive values, numbers, booleans, and explicit recursion. So chapter two, is the language for the chapter two of SICP, and it adds pairs. So chapter three adds variables and assignment for stateful programming. And choice chapter four adds uh, support for metaprogramming. So chapter one is uh, the tiniest possible language that you may want to use in a course. Um, it has just what you need to do purely functional programming, uh, including uh, constant declarations, uh, function declarations. It is an, a statement-oriented language like any other mainstream language today. Uh, so it's a block-structured, uh, lexically-stoped language. And uh, in, on the expression side, you also have nothing surprising. Uh, we have Lambda expressions uh, um, as any uh, modern language has. Uh, to give you an idea of uh, how programming feels like in our programming environment, which is called the Source Academy, let me um, uh, click on this link. Uh, every program can have a URL in our uh, environment, and the Source Academy is a web-based programming environment. So here you see the IDE coming up, and it is an, uh, a, pr a program that uses uh, our uh, graphics library called Runes. So you can stack two graphic entities together, uh, you can put them beside each other, you can visualize them, and you can create a rune from a URL. So this is an example to create a rune from a URL. So you, if you click, uh, you run the program, you see the splash uh, URL that is in this, um, that is loaded from this uh, website. And uh, if you uh, want to use assignment in this source chapter one, uh, that is a purely functional language. Uh, if you uh, want to assign logo URL to uh, some other string, uh, you uh, try to run this program. Sorry. Um, you try to run this program, you see uh, the error message, assignment expressions are not allowed in this language. So you cannot do uh, what, uh, you cannot uh, venture outside of the language that we uh, prescribe for the students. Um, uh, what you see is a little uh, recursive program to give rise to a fractal pattern. Uh, so if you uh, change the uh, input number here, uh, you see here the um, fractal pattern arising, you see graphically how recursion unfolds. So that should give you a little flavor for how programming feels like in this, in this environment called the Source Academy. Source Chapter 2 then adds primitive expressions for uh, lists and uh, pairs. So data structures is the theme of Chapter 2 of SICP. So we add uh, the null um, primitive expression in JavaScript. We add pair head and tail to mirror schemes, cons, car, and cutter. And we add a library for this processing. So chapter three adds constructs for uh, stateful programming. So you see here uh, the let declaration uh, for lexically scoped variables, and you see 
uh, variable assignment expressions. In our CS1 course, we also add while loops and for loops, although they're not used in SICP. We also add arrays in their minimal uh, form, uh, including uh, array literal expressions and array access and assignment expressions. Uh, finally, source chapter four um, introduces a parse function uh, that uh, allows us to do meta programming. And for the implementation, over to Boyd. Thanks a lot, Marty. Um, so uh, you've seen uh, this uh, new uh, uh, set of, of sub-languages of JavaScript. Um, how did we implement this? Well, uh, we have our own program environment, programming environment that you've seen, the Source Academy. Um, this is a, a open source project. Um, mostly written in TypeScript and Elixir. Um, and it has many uh, learning tools, which I will go uh, uh, through some examples very shortly. Um, but the most important part of it is that it is developed for students uh, uh, by students. Um, this is a project uh, which has uh, around 150, our GitHub organization has around 150 people in it. Um, and here is the current uh, leadership uh, of the Source Academy and everyone but those last four names uh, are just students. Um, uh, uh, this is a, a, a student-run project. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the components of the Source Academy. So we have uh, a parser. We, we use the um, uh, Acorn parser. It's an open source JavaScript parser to build the abstract syntax uh, tree of a student's program. Um, and during this, we also check for any disallowed JavaScript syntax. So that might be things that we don't allow uh, uh, due to uh, the source chapter uh, language, the sum language that we're using. Um, and what we get out is, in the end is a valid uh, source uh, abstract syntax tree. Uh, the way that we execute the programs is not just uh, to run them in the browser immediately. Um, we require, um, uh, because of uh, 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 the use of SICP, we require um, the ability to have proper tail calls. Um, this is necessary for iterative processes in uh, SICP. Um, and although this is part of the uh, ExmaScript uh, standard since about 2015, only Safari uh, uh, supports this feature. So um, we have a transpiler um, uh, that will detect and then implement proper tail calls uh, using a trampoline function in our language. Uh, using a, a trampoline function, and then we uh, uh, evaluate um, uh, that um, uh, 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 program uh, using the um, uh, JavaScript interpreter of the browser, the JavaScript, JavaScript engine of the browser, sorry. Um, we have a bunch of different learning tools uh, that have been uh, built by uh, students. Um, for example, uh, 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 we have an algebraic stepper. This is actually the subject uh, of um, uh, the next talk. Um, uh, and I won't go into any much detail, but uh, uh, stick around and you'll uh, learn a bit about that. Um, uh, we have a data visualizer. The data visualizer allows students to look at the uh, uh, data structures that they build in their program. Um, they can uh, 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 look at pairs and arrays, uh, lists and trees using this uh, data visualizer. Um, we also have an environment uh, visualizer. Um, basically, it allows students to uh, 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 put a breakpoint in their uh, uh, program, um, and then it shows a, um, a, uh, a picture much like this uh, here, uh, which follows the, the diagrams um, that are set out in SICP. Uh, it uses a continuation passing style, uh, style uh, interpreter uh, rather than the source transpiler um, that I just talked about. We also have some uh, uh, application domains. Um, so uh, how we uh, uh, get students to uh, explore these, these tools that uh, we've set out. The first one, if you watched uh, uh, my talk um, with Huawei, uh, we have a robotics uh, application domain. We also have a sound uh, uh, library. Um, this sound library is the subject of a talk uh, in the third session today. Um, we have uh, a curves library, which allows us to do a kind of a curve drawing. Um, and we also have um, a video, uh, uh, video processing uh, uh, library as well. Um, we've had some uh, 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 
pretty good uh, student feedback. So um, in the last uh, uh, year, our last time we've run this uh, course, 91% of students had said they agree or uh, uh, strongly agree that the Source Academy, our, our tool, uh, helped them understand the structure and interpretation of computer programs. Um, and indeed, uh, 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 Martin was saying before that um, we, we had scaled this module up from uh, having around 100 people all the way up to now 670 people. And you can see here that that uh, black line is, um, is the number of students in the module. Uh, you can see the moment where it went from being uh, uh, an optional module to a core, uh, sorry, an optional uh, uh, course to a core course. Um, and you can see that we have, there was a little bit of a dip in the first uh, uh, years of scaling up, but we're now back up to where we started again, back out of that valley. Um, our students seem uh, uh, very positive uh, on the course. Um, so uh, to summarize, um, shrinking this CS1 uh, language is liberating to everyone involved. Uh, to the students, uh, it kind of levels the playing field. They can achieve what their expert programmer peers can achieve. Um, they're not, uh, uh, even if they come into the, you know, uh, CS1 module with no programming experience. Um, for us instructors, we don't have to worry or sweep under the rug any language features that we're not prepared to talk about right now or don't suit the topic that we're talking about. Um, and for implementers, um, as, as you saw, all of these uh, uh, tools that I've shown you, uh, uh, the Source Academy itself, these are uh, 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 generated by uh, uh, students, produced by students um, during term projects. Um, so, uh, you know, implementers can design and implement new tools. And our outlook is very positive. Um, the design of the Source Academy uh, allows you to just pull out JavaScript and plug in sub languages of say Python or Java or C with, with some effort or even scheme. Um, uh, so fork it and try, uh, uh, the link is right here. Uh, and that is the end of our talk. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry, I think my mic died. Is that working? Oh, yes. Oh, we can hear you now. Now it's not working. Yeah. Can you hear me? Mm, yes. yes. Okay. Um, should I? Thought it was ready. Sorry, we're unable to hear it on our side. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Great. Um, so yeah, I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much for the talk. That was really cool. I especially love the summary slide about how it liberates those different classes of people. Um, one question that I had is, have you considered sort of extending this to the type system? So I noticed that, you know, this is implemented in TypeScript. So I was curious if you had any thoughts about having these sort of like language levels um, at the type level. Yes, that's a great, that's a great question. I also attended an, an, a session yesterday uh, where this question came very prominent in my mind. Uh, the SICP, of course, uh, is uh, using scheme, dynamically typed language, and types don't play, uh, explicit types don't play a role in SICP. But uh, our, my, my co-adapter of SICP uh, JS, um, uh, Tobias Rickstrad and I, we are thinking of uh, uh, developing this material further and typing is indeed uh, the candidate for the next chapter if we would ever write it. <laughs> Definitely. And, and uh, indeed, indeed, uh, uh, reflection of types, uh, th that, that's, that's an, an, uh, de definitely an, uh, an area to cover, especially for, for students, uh, to be able to um, uh, see the power of types in today's programming environments. All right. Oh, we got another question. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Braxton. Um, and I, my question is just, so this is um, being a CS1 course. And of course, there are often students coming in with varying levels of experience. Do you get any kind of pushback from students who say, I want to use mutation here? <laughs> yes, actually, that's what we see quite a lot. Uh, 
uh, with students, uh, uh, about 30% of our students have significant programming experience. And uh, for them, uh, the first couple of weeks are frustrating, for sure. Uh, but that type of frustration, uh, I think we're willing to accept uh, in exchange for the benefits that this, you, you see on this, on this slide. And they come on board, uh, especially today when we, uh, it is not, it is uh, uh, getting better and better uh, because functional programming is becoming more and more mainstream and they are motivated to learn functional programming, even though they come from a background of 10 years of JavaScript programming, uh, um, the uh, entirely uh, imperative style. Thank you, thank you. I just muted myself. Okay, so this is Charlie. I'll just add students do that for skiing too. So <laughs> there's nothing new there. Um, yeah, sure. Dennis, did you want to ask your question or would you like me to read it? Uh, I, I can ask it. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the problems is that everybody uh, at the beginning focuses on uh, introductory computer sciences learning programming. And actually some of it is actually learning how to do design thinking. And I'm wondering yeah. how much having the constrained language may actually help people, you know, take a step back and say, oh, I actually have to design this thing. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. But I, I think uh, the, there is the, the emphasis of SICP of our approach is uh, still programming in the small. Uh, there is no uh, th there is no real, the SICP doesn't really teach problem solving, doesn't really teach designing solutions. It has a wealth of nice, of, of very uh, good examples of well uh, crafted programs, but it doesn't teach how to, uh, how to solve, how to program. Uh, so the emphasis lies more on abstractions and on the mental models that arise when computer programs run. So the, the emphasis is different. We, we have then follow on courses uh, that, that uh, go into, you know, algorithms, design, uh, uh, and then eventually uh, programming in the large and software engineering and software design. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, you, you can try. We, 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 it's not in the scope of our course uh, to go into those design areas, but it would be interesting to see, you know, how you can constrain students effectively um, uh, for the purpose of uh, following particular design principles. Yep. Thanks. 